I would like to welcome everyone tonight to our regularly scheduled planning commission meeting. And as Will Carl noted, clerk. Yes. Okay. And we'll move on then to department head announcements. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I would like to um, introduce um, Tavin Kinnison uh, Brown, uh, the uh, Resource Management Agency's uh, new uh, senior planner. He came on board um, just after I did, and he is now working very closely with our staff on some of the more major projects that are going through the county. Would you like to say a few words? Sure. Uh, really, I didn't have much more than that. Thank you. I'm helping out in the planning department and glad to help here with uh, workload and getting th getting projects through. And um, Would you we'll like to give us a little of your experience? Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, Tavin Kinnis and Brown, I graduated from uh, Cal Poly Pomona, the other half of the Rose Float, as they say, in 91. But I've been a planner for 25 years. Uh, the last 15 of those here on the Central Coast with... Uh, Served the county of Monterey for 12 years, starting as an associate planner and working my way up as a planning services manager. I've also um, been the sole planner for the city of Marina, which is exploding with growth and has a lot of issues. And also in that recent 15 years, served the city of Monterey, where I um, was the liaison to the planning, uh, to the architectural review committee and um, oversaw several staff members. So I've had... Um, both urban and rural and regional planning experience. So I have a lot of tools in my tool chest here, but one thing I've learned about working in many communities is while I might have tools, um, it's not me to profess what needs to be done. That's the elected leaders, that's the, the appointed boards, and um, you know, you learn the business that to be carried out by that jurisdiction. So I'm, I'm all ears and, and doing listening and hope to uh, get good work done and, and help with the County San Benito. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, is, is there any uh, commissioner announcements? Okay, now we'll move on to the public comments then. If anyone in the audience would like to address the Planning Commission on items not on the agenda, We'd like to welcome you to the podium at this time. We will not be able to take a vote or do anything about it, but we welcome you to give us any input you'd like to give us. No speaker cards? Okay, then we will move on to the consent calendar. And that tonight, I think, just has the uh, acknowledgement of certificate of posting. Do I have a motion on that? Move we approve consent agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We'll move on then to the regular agenda. And I would like to take the public hearing on the uh, ENDS quarry first before the marijuana. So good evening again. And just as an introduction to the item this evening, the county has hired uh, benchmark resources here is to um, be reviewing the uh, actually they prepared the reclamation plan and some of the uh, updated materials that you'll be receiving tonight regarding the ENDS quarry. Um, the cover memo and staff report was written by Shandell Clark and that's here because as you know the item has been continued several times. Um, but I'd just like to let you know before you um, there's some supplemental information that will be touched on in um, uh, Dave Brown, Mr. Uh, Benchmark Resources, in his presentation towards the end of his presentation. But those are conditions of approval that are proposed for the mine and also carried over from days past, as well as some um, amendments and some supplemental information for um, housekeeping and some other affairs. So with that, I'd like to introduce our um, presenter of the staff report and, and the project today, uh, Mr. Dave Brown of Benchmark Resources. Good evening. Good evening. 
Um, my name is Dave Brown. I'm with Benchmark Resources, and um, I'm here as an extension of staff. We are under contract to the county um, <clears throat> for um, your annual mine inspections. Every mine in the state has to be inspected under the state mining law uh, once a year, and our firm has been under contract with San Benito County since about 2007. Uh, to do that and then part of our contract allows for other services uh, as may be required by staff so some of you may recall I was uh, in front of you back in uh, November of last year on the granite rock quarry we had a uh, uh, amendment to that reclamation plan and so this is the same type of um, service where we're working uh, as your staff um, helping um, your staff planners uh, to process applications regarding mines, um, which is um, one of our areas of expertise. So we have been working um, on this project uh, for the last couple of years to um, not just modify the reclamation plan, but to modify the use permit, in this case in response to um, a request by the operator to do so. I have a short PowerPoint um, to go through, and then I um, have other uh, supplementary documents, depending on what questions, uh, if any, um, you'd like to discuss. So we'll talk a little bit about the proposed project, the background of this site, its operation. Um, every uh, mining reclamation plan in the state is required to be reviewed by the Office of Mine Reclamation at the state level. They just changed their name as of January. I should have changed it here. It's now called the um, Division of Mine Reclamation. Uh, we have to comply with CEQA, as you're aware, and we have an amended reclamation plan then that I will um, discuss, as well as some revised conditions of approval. So this project is an amendment to the, rec, uh, the use permit, which this, this one has, as Granite Rock did not, that was a vested operation, and a reclamation plan. You may recall that um, we have a state uh, reclamation law, and you need two things in this state in order to have a legal operating mine. You have to have the authority to mine, which either comes from a, a vested right or through a use permit for modern operations like this one that you have. And then you have to uh, get a reclamation plan. Since 1976, we have the California Surface Mining Reclamation Act that requires every operation to get a reclamation plan approval. And what that essentially does is requires that the operator roll out a plan to plan forward. Mines are a little different from other land uses in that other land uses like residential developments are permitted and it's just assumed that they're gonna be there in perpetuity. But mines are a little bit different because eventually that mineral resource will be exhausted and SMERA requires that you plan then for when what the conclusion, the second land use as it's referred to at times, is going to be after mining. So there are some environmental aspects of SMERA um, that require the control sedimentation on site and runoff. Most of that is handled modern days by CEQA. Um, but then it also, it's really a land use entitlement that uh, uh, requires the operator to plan forward as to what the site's going to be like and be reclaimed to a usable condition to avoid um, public health and safety and environmental issues, uh, but mostly for land use purposes following mining. This operation um, was in your as described in your staff report it was originally permitted in 2003 uh, it was permitted with a relatively small footprint and a small production level the operator uh, came back in 2007 and ultimately in 2010 the use permit was revised to change the production levels from 20,000 tons a year to 100,000 tons a year but there was no change in the footprint and so he's back in front of you today to change the footprint in response to um, what has happened with the business. The site is located off of Sienega Road, uh, 11 miles south of Hollister, five miles west of Highway 25. Um, this shows you the current mining area. Sorry, I don't have a, uh, a pointer. 
current mining area in the center of the screen there, and then the proposed uh, footprint uh, is the yellow mining area. And what the operator is requesting is this is a, uh, uh, what we would call a dimension stone or sort of specialty rock products that he uh, sells primarily to the landscaping industry. So he sells decomposed granite and various sizes of dimension stone for landscaping purposes. And that market is, is different than the construction aggregates market where um, the landscaping market is very attentive to different types of materials. I don't know about you, but I've bought from those landscape yards and they sell decomposed granite, for example, as a, a, a very white version or a gold version, and they all have their different names and people like different types of, of uh, rock products and that's what this operator is attending to. And those materials vary over the site and that's what he wants access to a larger array of uh, materials over the over the hillside. This is the existing operation. This is the view east from the operation uh, down Line Kiln um, Road and Thompson's Creek. Uh, this is all ends property, and as well as to the west of the operation as Lime Kiln Road uh, continues up the canyon. Uh, view towards uh, Thompson's Creek from Lime Kiln, uh, from Sienega Road at Lime Kiln Road. The operation is some distance up the canyon. This is the approved permit, the mine and reclamation plan that was in your staff report. And then this is what uh, the reclama mine and reclamation plan that's in front of you. And so what we did is the operator essentially wanted the access over the hillside to a lateral extent and up to the top of the crest of the slope and then he's operating at a certain elevation at the bottom of the slope. So we provided essentially an, what we refer to as an operating envelope and this is what's really important to the Office of Mine, or the Division of Mine Reclamation uh, these days in looking at modern permits or what are the limits of the mining operation laterally and vertically and, and so that they can be assured that he is operating anytime as you inspect, he's operating within those operational limits. So <clears throat> coming up with those operational limits, then we came up with a volume of material and a time period if he were to do that at the existing level of production, which is very limited for this small scale operation at 100,000 tons a year. So this would run out, it would take 140 years or more to, to actually mine to this footprint if he did so. So in this case, what the reclamation plan provides is we have standards for reclamation for how you handle your topsoil, how you handle your revegetation, and so any surfaces that would be created if this operation stopped between now and when this footprint was ultimately created, he would have to reclaim that site to the standards in the plan, replace topsoil, any flat surfaces then would be um, converted to a, uh, a uh, revegetation of a temporary uh, erosion control um, type of, of uh, annual seed so that it could then be converted to agriculture and used just like the rest of the property uh, that Inns Vineyard uses. <clears throat> County code provides that uh, periodically reclamation plans may be revised An operator brings those in and asks for any amendments to the plans and those get processed such as we're doing now. Um, Sequel review, we circulated a new initial study and um, we had relatively limited comments. We had an email from Caltrans um, and we had a uh, uh, comment from the um, county assessor's office and uh, uh, one other internal comment. Uh, I'll get to those in a second. So biological resources, we added, uh, we updated, and I'll get to those in the end, also some updated mitigation measures, but one of the, we did three major things with the reclamation plan in terms of looking at um, the expanded footprint area. They're not changing production, so certain aspects of environmental compliance under CEQA don't change. Truck traffic doesn't change, 
air emissions doesn't change, water consumption doesn't change, all, all these sort of operational issues don't change because the operation essentially isn't changing the day-to-day -day operations. What is changing is the footprint over time. So we have to look at things like any change in biological resources for the new footprint area, the habitat differences, as well as sometimes over time since 2010 when we last had a permit review, um, new species might have been listed. So we ran that gauntlet through new biological resources um, evaluation. We also did an updated slope stability analysis in response to comments by the uh, Division of Mine Reclamation, and it, its ultimate conclusions were that the original slopes um, that were engineered um, meet all the current standards. And um, so we did update the biological resources for new pre-construction surveys as he expands into those new areas. Um, and then the county assessor's office mentioned uh, about the Williamson Act, and I'll go to this next slide first. So when this was originally permitted in 2003, Mr. Inns submitted an application for um, consistency determination of the Williamson Act and the uh, county assessor came back with a con uh, consistency determination for the hash marked area there. As you can see, he's currently operating um, west of that. He hasn't even expanded into that area, but the county assessor said for this new expanded footprint, um, he would need a new consistency determination. And we've run into this in other counties where you have compatibility of mines um, and, and the, the um, county assessor's office needing that determination that sometimes rolls out slowly over time because mining happens very slowly. You don't want to either have to cancel the contract or um, non-renew until you need to do so. So we came up with uh, amended condition then that um, as he expands at the, at the point he would expand a footprint over 100 acres. Right now he's at 14 or 15. So this might not happen for decades down the road. We don't know. Um, but at the point he did that, he would either need to come back for a new compatibility determination for the increase in area, or he would need to obviously cancel or non-renew uh, uh, ahead of time as that was going to roll out. But um, that probably won't happen for some time. But that was in response to the county assessor's comments. And then as we rolled those into the uh, conditions of approval and looked at the old ones, um, we decided we needed to really update some of these in that there were old references to mitigation measured numbers that were outdated uh, from the, uh, the changes over time. Um, there were also references to various agencies and departments that have changed names, including internally within the county and, and, and um, <clears throat> who's responsible in terms of following up with mitigations. Now we do that in terms of mitigation monitoring and reporting plans, so we prepared that. But then ultimately we've rolled all of these into new conditions of approval. We updated the revegetation and irrigation conditions to reflect changes in the reclamation plan. We updated the biological conditions, as I mentioned, and then um, updated stormwater management and monitoring. There were three conditions of approval that were with regard to management and monitoring of stormwater off of the site, which is essentially control of erosion and sedimentation. Now in this state, we have regulations that uh, that handle that, and so we've we've updated this to comply with current regulations. Those were in your handout then that Tavin uh, handed you um, prior to this. Um, in addition, I believe uh, you have a second handout that County Council has come back with a couple of modifications to to the conditions. When we were continued from the uh, last hearing, there was a uh, question about operational compliance with conditions of approval and how has he done. And so we went back actually and, and looked at that um, from the previous conditions of approval. And um, I actually prepared a table and went over that with staff and we could address any of those if there's a particular concern, but basically we verified that uh, he has complied with all of the conditions of approval from the um, previous 2010 approval. Um, in addition, I should mention that state law, uh, as, I, as I said at the beginning of this um, PowerPoint, requires at every county visit a mining operation and inspect it annually for compliance with this reclamation plan. So 
there are certain things in a reclamation plan such as as he expands in the footprint area he's required to recover those topsoils and set those aside for reclamation purposes and so that's sort of an active thing that happens with operations a lot of reclamation requirements don't happen until you were actually going to reclaim at the end of mining but there are certain things that happen along with uh, along with the annual um, operations and so we inspect those annually and Andrew Heineman who's with me here tonight is our um, staff geologist and he's a mining engineer and he's actually the guy doing the the annual inspections at the uh, for all of your sites including this one in the county and so he could help me with any questions you might have with that uh, at that I'm here to address any questions you might you might have are there any questions from the Commission at this time I have some yeah okay. Jean we'll start with Jean okay um, I also had an opportunity to go out and had a nice tour from Mr. Ench. thank you for that um, and so I'm familiar with the layout of what you've described but I, I still have some questions with regard to what's before us uh, mainly because um, and one thing you've, you've sort of indicated in an answer on that perplexed me greatly, which was why 140 years. Yes. So um, tell me a little bit more about um, how that works and what the limitations are. Let me see if checking for understanding. What I understood you to say is that 140 um, had to do with the potential of output, if you will, from the new expanded mining area. Is that correct? It's basically doing the math. Yeah. So you, we came up with that area, and so we have a certain volume, and so you do the math that says if he's limited to 100,000 tons a year, how many years would it take to mine that out? Okay. And so it's just a math problem. It wasn't, we did that as part of just, again, it was a volume calculation and doing the math. It wasn't a particular request by uh, Mr. Enns in terms of a 140 years right. uh, permit. It was just. Well, okay, so that works. makes sense, but then further checking, how does the commission then um, phrase the permit if we choose to, you know, okay it tonight in terms of that limitation? Can one say by, you know, we approve this condition being A, for this one anyway, um, that the 140 year percentage per year is X and anything over and above X, which would mean more going out, presumably would be subject to further review as the years go on yeah you I, I don't think you would need to do that uh, council can say but he's limited by his permit to 100,000 tons a year so if he did want to change it you're right he would have to come back and ask for an increase in production you'd be subject to this whole process and seek will review again in terms of the the time period and how you express it it's actually in the um, it's in the documents so we gave it a year Smera requires that you specify that end date and that proposed end date as Smera says so it's in there what I, I can't remember what it was but that's all right yeah I'm just one to make sure I get this right and so I, I thought that was what it is so basically we're granting the current level of production just different material different part of the mine if, if that goes through um, but any further trucks if you will or whatever transport may become 140 years from now who heck none of us even know if there'll be roads right so um, any any of those further things would be subject to coming in and saying hey I want to do something more now and go through the same process any change in operation that's absolutely right he would be required to come back to the table okay that's helpful um, one other thing in terms of operation now um, I know the material that Mr. Ann's described um, is um, something that people want a lot, and it's big, heavy hunks of rock. Um, would there be any difference in the weight that the trucks are going to be carrying? He said same amount of trucks, but what about the weight? Because the roads are my concern there. Right. Uh, so I'm not necessarily the expert in that, but the, the weight limit on trucks is regulated uh, by Caltrans. And so, so they, he can't really load heavier trucks than is allowed by those regulations. So there's no, the, okay, the, so, um, the, the number of trucks again varies at any mining operation based on because they're seasonally, they do a little bit more work in the summer, but ultimately he would hit that cap of 100,000 tons a year and that's by what his permit control is. And how is that verifiable, the cap in the 100,000? Is there a weight? thing when the trucks go out on a scale or something or how does that work 
So uh, as part of his annual operator report, he actually has to report that, and I think the the, it might say under penalty of perjury, but it's to the state. Uh, so annually, he submits a report to the state, um, and uh, he he tells them how much production he has, and he pays a fee to the state as part of that. And those fees that are collected statewide are actually what funds the Division of Mine Reclamation. But uh, but th but that's a required um, submittal, and uh, they're very aggressive anymore about uh, operators that. That fail to submit those annual reports because that's how they get paid. Okay. Um, I have a couple more questions, but I don't want to monopolize. Oh, Anybody else want to go ahead? Go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm not very good at the geography down there because I haven't been there that often, even though I've lived in this county for 30 something years. But um, and another concern for me because it has been noted by some people I've talked with is um, the new national park the pinnacle is down there and it's not too far away but i don't know how close it is to this mining site and whether that might be a factor in terms of truck traffic because i know that's the road they have to use is 25. do you have any information on that? so their traffic route is specified as um, lying hill to cienega to highway 25 right. and then i expect um the majority of since they're because of their market the road trucks are all going north probably from that point not south towards where pinnacles would be but from this stand uh from this sequel review i think we didn't really consider any of that in that truck traffic isn't changing so so whatever baseline of air emissions or anything else is not changing as a result of today's approval it's, but I can't speak specifically to anything about pinnacles or its distance from the site or okay. well, anything if, myself. If one of the ENDS parties wishes to answer some questions, I can ask them, but yeah. I just appreciate the scope of your review. Um, what else was there? I, I was just had written down about what the assessor said about a consistency determination but you're satisfied at this point that you've amended the condition to comply with whatever those concerns were is that correct I believe so we gave those to staff and uh, to give back to the uh, assessor's office that was done prior to the last month's scheduled hearing and the assessor did not come back with any concerns thank you for your responses good Mark? <coughs> <coughs> Couple of questions. Is that, in the Williams and that compatibility, do you know how, it's, how they're charged in terms of the production? Turn in other words, the Williams and that. Mark, the, is oh, your, mic, your mic? They can't. Yeah. Old people in the back can't hear. Uh, I'll holler then. Uh, the Williams and I did, and there's an annual survey about the production of ag off of those lands. How does that impact the mining compatibility? Or do they, you know, monitor? It's, just, it's compatible, go ahead. Well, again, staff might be able to, uh, to help out with that. Our experience in working with mining operations, we have many counties, obviously, that have Williamson Act, uh, and, and sites may or may not have uh, be contracted land. So it's an open space and agricultural lands preservation act, right? And and mining can take away potentially agricultural land if if the purpose of that site preservation is preserving prime ag land, for example. That's not what we have here. This is more open space and hillside. And so so the purpose of going through that review then for compatibility would say would be is mining going to jeopardize sort of the integrity of that agreement that the board of supervisors has with that landowner um and and, and so you have to go through that compatibility determination i'm not sure i'm answering your question well yeah the way it was well, asked, i guess the main thing is still maintains a situation where they can't be subdivided there's another piece of that right so mining wouldn't have any effect on any of that uh it would just be you know mining changes the land potentially and, okay. and so it would be from the board of supervisors review and the in the county assessors review is that 
change acceptable and compatible with the contract. Okay, this, the, the, the re readdressing the, the <laughs> reclamation, what drove it to, to be addressed and what was changed? The reclamation plan? Yes. So, so the, the, uh, his de the, the operator's desire to access more area means that you have to get a new reclamation plan approved to cover that area. And so the, that's what SMERA requires is that any area you're going to touch in mining in the state has to have a matching reclamation plan for that area. And so that's why we had to update the reclamation plan. Is that your the, question? The actual conditions didn't change. No, one thing we did change is the revegetation, and, and that was um, some dialogue back and forth with the Division of Mine Reclamation. His previous reclamation plan was to essentially to um, take it back to chaparral habitat, a yeah. and, uh, and through this process, we realized there's really no uh, purpose or anything to be gained by that to, degree, to the degree that this operation creates flat surfaces those would be um, adaptable to agricultural uses and that would be the preferred future so we changed the revegetation to be uh, mostly interim revegetation for erosion control purposes and such that it, it would be converted to vineyards uh, more vineyards on the property or whatever the landowner decided at that time what happens in a situation where they really don't have much topsoil i don't think there's much topsoil there pretty much a rock pile with some dirt on it. Right. But the point is, what happens? Do they have to bring in more soil? If it, maybe they can only make six inches of soil over the whole thing. Right. So Smera allows the reclamation plans be site specific, just simply because of that. So it's not a, pre it, at the state level, the regulations are not prescriptive that says, for example, for agricultural land, you have to do six inches of soil or anything. They're not like that. They basically allow the operator to propose something, and then you go through this review process with the Office of Division of Mine Reclamation. So, so it, Samara also does not require an operator to improve a site beyond what it is existing. So you're right. On steep slopes like this, topsoil is very thin. You really don't have much of it. And it's very difficult to recover, both because of the steepness of the slopes and because it is so thin. Yeah. From an equipment standpoint, the rule of thumb I was always told is anything less than three inches, you basically can't scrape it off with a piece of equipment and recover it much. So you do what you can. And, and in this case, so when you get down to those surfaces, again, your final surfaces, um, maybe you've, uh, you've accumulated enough over time, or you can rip it uh, and, and prepare the substrate. You can also improve those soils by growing plants or whatever. In this case, if they put an interim revegetation of, um, of annual grasses and other mixes that we've got there, they grow, you know, even if they use decomposed granite and rip the surface um, with very little topsoil. The topsoil in this case probably provides the nutrients, which those can um, accumulate over time as the, as the grasses grow. Ray, do you want to? Yeah. <clears throat> kind of like just kind of just stating a few things to see if we uh, get an understanding here. First, this is a conditional use permit. Okay, so as a conditional use permit, and uh, Commissioner Zakin seems to be worried about this, if anything happens or occurs, they breach any part of their conditional use agreement or they suddenly become a nuisance, we immediately bring them back to the commission and readjust this because it's conditional use. Okay. Um, Pinnacles is about 30 miles from here. It's about 10 miles to the site. So as the condor flies, maybe about 20 miles mm -hmm. from this site to Pinnacles. And then don't the, don't the trucks, when they're loaded, won't they end up going over into 101 uh, and probably end up hitting one of those trunk scales to be weighed and violations for the truck? So truck weight issues probably are not just local. They, and they're not just site-driven. They're also highway-driven. Um, 
But the big thing is, if they want to change this in any fashion form, they've got to come back and get permission, essentially. Right. Now, the big question, 140 years because you just do the math, this is kind of normal, isn't it? I mean, let's face it, some people in the audience have been at their site for a long time as well. Um, and these are kind of typical for quarry operations and rock operations. It is in modern permitting. Um, we we work all over the state, and there's some places that, um, again, part of this some years ago was encouraged at the state level is to keep a short lease on people essentially, mm -hmm. um, you know, give them a 20 year permit, and I think that may have what been uh, what was happening here. The problem with that is you keep be bringing people back through the system, and it's very, very expensive, as the operator can attest, and very time-consuming for the operator and staff and the county to keep doing this. Um, and and so practically, unless something is changing, there's no reason to bring them back to the table. And permit links, we've seen them get longer and longer for also economic reasons, in that uh, in, a, in the construction aggregate industry, the equipment that these guys use is very expensive. You know, you're talking a half million dollars for a loader or something. And so for the banks to finance that, they need to know that it's it, you've got a, a long-term business secured. So, yes, we've seen that, and this is, this is not uh, un, unusual. Right. And if truck traffic suddenly all of a sudden for some reason becomes a big nuisance, then the neighbors will be yelling and we'll be back here. Yeah, you have the ability, I think, through your ordinance, there's nuisance things that are even separate from that. You also have a mining ordinance that has certain requirements, but and we reviewed all of that also as part of this review of the conditions. But, yeah, and then there's just nuisance. You can, if somebody brings a nuisance complaint, um, that's a separate issue in the county through noise or, or whatever, the, or dust uh, can be a nuisance. But I find it, I just want to make sure that the the commission knows that it's difficult to, I mean, it, when you get the use permit, you do have a right to operate that pursuant to the terms of the use permit. So if somebody starts complaining about the truck traffic and they are operating pursuant to the terms of the use permit, they do have that right to operate pursuant to those terms of the use permit for the term. Yeah. Like the turkey farm. Like, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. yes. like, well, that's why I was asking about the uh, weight changes, because um, I don't really know, but it seems to me that the notice requirements for this permit and probably all of them I, i'm so new to this i don't know what they are but but um you know the, the county doesn't have really a newspaper anymore or any public forum that can be relied upon everybody to look at and read so there would really be very little likelihood that most people in san benito county even people out in that way would know about this sort of stuff so because of that i feel a higher duty if you will to to say hey what if um, somebody is going to really be impacted by this and they didn't get a chance because then you can say yeah let's do a you know if it's a nuisance you can bring it up but not really <laughs> because we've already given permit within the scope of what we're talking about <coughs> So I just think we need to weigh these things and make sure we're, we know what we're doing and why there's some logic to 140 years and what the limitations are. Mm -hmm. And in that respect, I had just had one other question for you. Jean, uh, oh, you sorry. Can, wait, let's finish. Oh, I'm sorry. That. I thought you were fine. No, Go ahead. I think that yeah. Something about, I can answer that uh, weight issues. There's what you call DOT. They're a CHP. They run around. They can set up anywhere. And if anybody has complaints that they think the truck's overloaded, they stay in front of the gate and weigh the trucks. And you cannot take a truck over 80,000 pounds. I wasn't alleging they would be overloaded. I just thought there might be a difference in weight that would cause it's, different harm to the it's road. It's not going to be, well, that's maximum weight you can put on a truck. If it goes, the tonnage is not going to change from my understanding of what's being uh, mined right now. It's going to be the same. Maybe a truck's taking 10 tons, maybe a truck's taking 20 tons, you know? And then with the new regulations for the footprint of carbon, there, uh, after you have three, four trucks, you got to get clean air. So, you're actually the air is cleaner now than running uh, the old trucks. Mm -hmm. So I, and the way it's calculated the 140 years is with math. So, one of one of the mine operators we worked with years ago used to say that um, he'd say I'm pretty sure that 25 tons of tomatoes uh, a truck carrying 25 tons of tomatoes weighs the same as 25 t tons of aggregate. But does it weigh more than 25 tons of uh, cotton? <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, Jean, did you have another oh, question? Oh, yeah. Well, in terms of relative to that, um, we know now where the 140 years comes from. How about the new boundaries? Were these something that you guys um, calculated, or did the operator come in and say, this is what I want? The operator basically said, I want to be able to access these areas of the hillside, and we drew a line around it. Okay. Okay. And our geologist walked the whole hillside with them, looking at all that. Yeah. Taking contours into consideration and, and, and where the rock was variable, but what rock was exposed where and all that. It wasn't just haphazardly drawn in this area. Do you really think this area is right? It's actually taking the line. Okay. Sure, repeat that over the microphone. It wasn't haphazard. Yeah. yeah, so he's basically saying that, that he helped determine those limits by uh, walking the hillside, looking at the geology, and reading the topography and, and setting those boundaries. Okay. Good, now, thank you. Are, any other questions from the Planning Commission before I open it up for the public? No. Okay, I will now open up the public hearing. And Mr. Enns did bring some rock that he's talking about in the bag there. Gene, if you'd like to look at it, and, oh. and we can pass it down for the rest of the commission. And he also was nice enough to bring some water if you want to actually dust it off so you can see <laughs> Well, I was out there, and I, I understand the concept, and, and I can see the cliffs and what he might get. Mm -hmm. But I cannot lift this, so <laughs> I can't okay. pass it down. Well, but I'll be glad if somebody else wants to move it. <laughs> I did look in the back. Do you want to take a look and take it down there? I have a left arm that doesn't allow to pick up things. So. Okay. All right. Now, are there uh, any speaker cards, Janet? No speaker cards. Does anyone? Uh, <laughs> of course. Did you fill out a speaker card because we don't know who you are? Different granite, that's why uh, he wants to mine it. Yeah. My name is Jim West. I'm with Granite Rock. Uh, we buy rock from Enns Quarry because we don't make pretty rock. We make strong rock. And it's used, to, we cover it with asphalt and with concrete. My concern here is the road maintenance fee that you're going to proposing to do a per, per ton fee on the quarry. We have fought this for years and years. Uh, the Freeman Quarry opened up in 101 and 25 because we had a nickel a ton and they didn't have it up there. You cannot put a per ton. I think the idea of a nexus study to look at as their damage, and if there is damage from the trucks, have them pay for it. That's fine. But to take a per ton fee is, I think, totally unconscionable for the thing. As we said, um, uh, Dave Brown stole my line. 80 tons in, in, in a tomato truck or in a rock truck, it's all the same. And I understand that if there's a danger for it or if there's road damage, do a study. If there's a study, if it's traceable to them, charge them. But do not, do not put a per ton tax on it. We went through that in this county for 20 years back on it, and it never worked. And it, and it really hurt the, the operations in this county. So I think everything is fine. I think they're a great organization. They need that area because they go around picking up pretty rocks. We don't pick them up. We just mine them all. But do not, please, put a per ton tax on mining. Because mining, you only can do that because mining needs a, a permit. To haul 80,000 tons in a truck without a permit, they're all over this county. So that would be my only concern. Any questions? Anybody else want to address the Planning Commission? Okay, I will close the public hearing and bring it back to the Commission. Would staff like to address the, the fee? Um, it is not a tax, which um, I understand that the county may consider at some point in the future imposing a tax which would actually generate revenue to the county. What we proposed in the condition of approval, um, it's actually um, would have a nexus study to compensate the county for actual impacts due to the heaviness of the tr travel. Um, this is not going to be, hopefully as time goes along, that we're going to be able to do it for more industries. Um, we're looking at the same issue um, for other in other areas, not just mining, but for every area that we can for specific operations that have an impact on county roads, 
um, to actually have a nexus study to show the actual impact and make sure that those operations that have that impact on the county roads pay for that cost. There was a presentation that was presented to the Board of Supervisors um, not that long ago that shows that there's a um, kind of a steep curve on the, he the, the weight of the trucks, like a heavy truck can have multiple impacts as compared just to a single family car. And so that the truck traffic does cause a lot more impacts on the county roads and we wanna make sure that those impacts are, um, uh, that we do recover from the operations, the actual true cost of the impacts on the county road. So it's not a revenue generating um, uh, tax at this point is just to, to compensate for the, the actual damage that's caused to the roads. Is this done by ordinance, Barbara? No, this is actually um, as a condition of approval. I added it into the condition of approval number 33. Now, if we do a revenue generating tax, it would be by an ordinance and a vote to the public. But this one's just the actual uh, change condition of a 33. Originally, it looks like there was a 6.8 cents per uh, ton, but I believe that that's an old number and has not been updated to reflect uh, current costs that would be um, uh, incurred as a result of damage to county roads. So we are doing a nexus study in another context right now, and I'm going to ask that they kind of look at this this route to um, to add that into a nexus study so we can get an, uh, an actual true cost of um, operations. Thank you. So then on this number 33, it appears yeah. that this is in a, <clears throat> the fees in play. So how do we work this into the wording of this? It's just staff changes on the Nexus study? Uh, the number 33. Mm-hmm. Because it says she'll pay that, a fee that, of 6.8 cents per ton. Right. There's a page that... The, that was just passed out um, this evening. The language in bold, it's a single page form with the additional changes. The language in bold is what I've added um, to address. I guess I didn't get that one. Okay. The language in bold indicates that during the term of the use permit, the county may conduct a nexus study to determine the cost um, to impacts on all designated county roads. Okay, very good. And, and the applicant has seen all of the changes. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. I don't, I believe that they're, that they didn't have an, an objection to the language. Yes, it is. Okay, are there any other questions from the commission? I, I just want clarification on this from county council then. You're recommending that this happen. Mm -hmm. um, so what we would do is approve that to go forward, right? Yes, the There's condition in place yet, but you you want to look into it for this and other industries. Yes, you would approve the conditions of approval as amended, and I think that staff has one more minor change to the condition of approval, but um, just the conditions of approval as amended as presented by staff. Did you want to address this other one, or do you want me to? And does staff have another any? Additional changes? Did you want to say something about that? That needs to that will be reflected. That that condition of approval has changed. Yes. Okay. There, there are a couple of further uh, corrections. Um, condition number twenty-four um, refers to the original conditional use permit as a fourteen-acre site that needs to reflect the current acreage being proposed. And then it also uh, is the original condition of 100,000 tons of rock annually and limited to 20 years, and that needs to be corrected to reflect the uh, proposed um, number of years. So those are just two outdated um, statements. Okay, and I'm sorry, what is the new acreage? I think it's 310. Mm -hmm. It is, yes. Everyone has those on a number 24. It's changed to 310 acres mm -hmm. and 140 years. Yes. Okay. And there's no other changes then? No. All right. No. I'm ready for a motion. Okay. Well, I'd like to move we adopt the proposed mitigated negative declaration and mitigated monitoring program and approve the amended use permit and reclamation plan amendment 
use permit number 858-02A and RP2002-14-6 with the findings and conditions of approval found in the staff report and any and all changes by staff. How's that, Barb? Perfect. <clears throat> Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So ordered. Okay. Uh, we're moving on then to the uh, study session on the marijuana ordinance. If anyone would like to address the Planning Commission, if you would please take a minute and fill out a card and uh, bring it up to the clerk, and then we'll, we'll just break for a couple minutes. Uh, Mr. Enns, if you'd like to pick up your rock. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this one has got gold in it. Reclaim land. There you go. There you go. Make sure you show your reclamation permit when you pick that up. Yeah. Congratulations. He's got his water bottle. It's a nice planet. For, and we're ready for staff. If, are you representing staff, Barbara, on this? Or? Okay. I have two of these here. Have yours, Mark? Do you have I have one of those, too. I don't know what it's for, but. That's for this thing. Madam Chair, did you want me to wait for? Yes, they said oh, they were okay. going to be right. Okay, great. Barb, did you did you have any introductory any introductory comments, or did you? I could get right into it if you'd like. Um, the marijuana, the draft cultivation ordinance was presented to the board of supervisors at um, the, uh, one of the May the May meetings. I think it was the May 9th meeting. The goal is to bring it back to I mean, bring it to the planning commission for a first look tonight. Receive any comments and. Um, suggestions the planning commission would have then we're going to go back to the ad hoc ad hoc group and incorporate the changes that were resulting from the last board of supervisors meeting and the changes that the planning commission would like to see tonight with the goal of bringing it back to the planning commission for action at the june meeting to be presented to the board of supervisors at the july meeting as the board can i mean as the commission can recall we're operating under an interim ordinance right now for cultivation and in, um, it will expire in September of 2017 unless the Board of Supervisors extends it on a four-fifths vote. The goal um, that that we've been kind of drafted with is to develop a cultivation ordinance that the Board can can adopt in lieu of continuing with that urgency interim ordinance. So that's the timeline that we have for developing this. There's going to be multiple components of this. This is just one part of the 
the whole system that's going to be presented to the Planning Commission. You may see more of it in the future, but this, so I'll let Victor present this part to the Planning Commission. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Barb. Appreciate, uh, appreciate that. Uh, the background there, uh, Madam Chair, uh, members of the Commission, uh, Victor Gomez with uh, Pinnacle Strategy. Um, I'm here um, as a consultant for the county to help guide them through the um, cannabis um, adoption um, process. Um, my expertise and my background is in public policy, um, and I've worked for uh, multiple jurisdictions, um, helping guide them through the, the public policy process on um, medical cannabis um, over the past five, six years. So um, here I am today, um, as Barbara mentioned, we went to the Board of Supervisors um, on May 9th with uh, a draft ordinance that was, um, um, that was really put together by um, a stakeholders group uh, within uh, city staff, including two ad hoc committee members, Supervisor Rivas um, and Supervisor Medina. So um, I'll go ahead and get started with the presentation. Have you, if you have any questions, if you'd like, Madam Chair, I could take those questions during the presentation um, or we could wait till, till the end. Um, either way works for me. So um, uh, just a, a little bit of background and in, in why we're here. Um, in, in 96, Prop uh, 215 uh, passed, uh, the Compassionate Use Act passed by about 55 to 45% vote of uh, California voters. Um, the passage of, of 215 was um, uh, at that time and, and, and now certainly playing out to be a pretty significant victory for, uh, for those that uh, felt the, the need of uh, a medical use for, uh, for marijuana, for cannabis. Um, it essentially exempts patients from and, and defined caregivers from uh, possession and cultivation of marijuana um, uh, criminal, the, the criminal law that, that goes behind it and it really exempts them and allows them to grow for uh, medical purposes. Um, in the United States, the use of cannabis uh, for medical uh, purposes is currently legal in 29 uh, states, uh, including Guam, Puerto Rico, and um, D.C. Uh, lately, what we've been hearing, at least on the national front, is uh, in recent polling has indicated that 83% of Americans uh, say that doctors should uh, be able to prescribe uh, marijuana uh, to patients, um, according to the results of, of this poll that was conducted a few weeks ago, about a month ago. Uh, and 14% uh, opposed uh, legalizing uh, medical cannabis uh, for that use. Um, in 2015, Governor Brown signed legislation that established uh, really the first uh, regulatory framework uh, for the upcoming stages of medical um, cannabis, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, MRSA. Um, the, the regulation in the Safety Act provides um, for licenses to be issued by uh, three authorities, the uh, Bureau of Medical Cannabis Regulation, the new, new state, um, authority, uh, the Department of Food, of a Food and Ag, and the Department of uh, Public Health um, as well. The licensing authorities are responsible for developing the regulations which actually um, have or just recently released. Uh, they're being circulated right now. There are draft um, uh, rules um, and regs that uh, we're reviewing. I know County Council and, and Sarah on staff is also uh, reviewing. Um, in addition to uh, the licensing authorities, there are uh, uh, state entities that will assist in, in implementing uh, the act. Uh, you'll see them um, listed here, um, MRSA and, and adult use as well, Prop 64 uh, will you know, obviously have a huge impact on um, a variety of departments uh, from the state and as you'll learn, uh, a variety of departments within the, the county of San Benito as well. Um, and just recently, um, Prop 64, uh, and that's the Adult Use um, Act um, of uh, 2016, that here locally passed uh, at about roughly 56 to, to 44 percent here in San Benito County, essentially mirrored what we saw um, statewide uh, as well, which legalized uh, marijuana uh, not just for medical purposes, but essentially for, um, for recreational use if you're 21 and over. Um, it allows, again, uh, for use of those 21 and older, uh, possession up to uh, 28 and a half grams 
uh, an, an ounce of dried cannabis um, and eight grams of um, uh, of dried, uh, excuse me, of, uh, of concentrate um, uh, wax and, and uh, so on. Um, indoor cultivation um, of up to six plants for personal use per household inside a private residence or accessory structure um, or outside and possession of any cannabis produced by those plants. So uh, you know, the 28 and a half actually does increase if the, the product that you're growing uh, within your home um, is exceeding uh, the 28 and a half um, grams. Prop 64 created two uh, additional state taxes, uh, a cultivation tax, as you see listed here, tw uh, 925 per ounce uh, for, the, for the bud and 275 for the leaf and a 15% uh, point of sales tax uh, for, uh, for cannabis. Um, and then eventually the taxes will be adjusted uh, for inflation uh, starting in uh, 2020. Um, I'm not going to go through these unless um, you'd really, really like me to, <laughs> but um, a lot of folks ask how will, how will the revenues be spent, and these are specifically tax revenues. This, we're not getting into the county, uh, potential county revenue that is associated with, with the industry. Um, so roughly about $2 million per year will be allocated for um, cannabis research. Uh, and to study medical uh, marijuana, uh, 10 million per year for 11 years for uh, public um, universities, California uh, universities for uh, research and implementation of Prop 64. Um, Three million annually uh, for five years to the Department of, um, to, to the Highway Patrol uh, for de developing protocols um, regarding driving, potentially driving under the influence of cannabis. Uh, 10 million uh, increasing uh, by 10 million uh, until settling at 50 in 2022 for grants for local health departments, uh, community-based nonprofits, um, and, and a variety of, of others for substance abuse and, and so on. Uh, the remaining revenues will be distributed, um, as you see here, which is um, uh, really the base of what's left over from, from those taxes that will be used. Um, as I uh, demonstrated in the other, um, the other slides. So here locally, um, our overview uh, to date, um, essentially this earlier this year, Chairman um, De La Cruz um, appointed, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Supervisor Rivas and Supervisor Medina uh, to explore, um, to, to form this ad hoc committee on cannabis and really explore um, options uh, for the county to potentially move forward with um, a cannabis ordinance. Um, on February 15th, I came on board to, to assist the county um, through the process, um, and the ad hoc committee um, essentially invited, the two committee members essentially invited uh, a group of internal stakeholders, city, uh, excuse me, county staff that um, would be impacted by, by this, uh, by this uh, ordinance and has met uh, numerous times over the last two and a half months. Uh, the stakeholders include the, the DA, Sheriff's Department, Sheriff Thompson and Candy were a, uh, have been a part of it and will continue to be a part of it. Um, uh, CAO's office, the Ag Commissioner, uh, uh, PO, uh, County Council and Code Enforcement um, uh, as well. Uh, so what has the committee discussed? Uh, well, we've discussed a variety of issues that will uh, impact um, the, the county. Um, before I continue, there are uh, multiple components to, um, to the cannabis industry. Um, you have cultivation, you have manufacturing, which is the processing of the product, uh, whether it's extraction or creating edibles and, and so on, and then the dispensing um, component um, as well. Um, the, the, the ad hoc committee has directed me to focus on cultivation pr uh, first. Um, they want to be able to create this regulatory program for cannabis cultivation um, first uh, before they move forward to potentially uh, manuf a manufacturing ordinance um, uh, as well. Uh, dispensing um, is allowed uh, within the, the city, the city of Hollister. Um, they do allow two dispensaries or will allow two dispensaries. Those are currently, those applicants are currently being vetted and um, uh, eventually they'll, they'll go through their licensing, which I believe will likely land around 
the um, either late June or early August timeframe. Um, and the reason I mention that is because uh, the ad hoc committee members um, uh, signaled that they, they felt that dispensing in, in the unincorporated areas of the county really, really was unnecessary, um, especially considering that the city of Hollister um, had adopted a two dispensary policy. So um, currently dispensing um, is um, off the table um, for the ad hoc committee. So we've had discussions around the land use component, which you'll hear about in just a sec. Um, uh, cultivation sizes, uh, greenhouse structures, um, the taxing structure, which you'll, you'll likely hear about uh, later. Um, setbacks for cultivation sites and, and um, sensitive uses, um, including bus stops, churches, and, and so on. Um, and then also discuss the, the cost recovery component. Um, a program like this, especially the cultivation component in a rural county like San Benito, could certainly, um, can certainly draw a lot of interest for cultivation. We are an ag-based county. Um, this is an agricultural product. Um, so you're likely going to get uh, quite a bit of interest in, in the cultivation side of, of cannabis. So, um, you know, we've had those uh, discussions on, okay, what's it going to take to implement uh, an ordinance like this? And what type of structure will the county need really to, um, to be able to absorb uh, the potential uh, influx of, of members of the industry that want to come into San Benito County um, and conduct business um, here? So, um, sorry, so with that said, we have uh, put together a cost recovery model uh, to make sure that any, any time dedicated to this program will be uh, re recovered uh, through this, um, um, through this uh, model of, um, uh, of charging the, the industry for, for the time dedicated by, by county staff. <clears throat> So the draft cultivation ordinance highlights, um, obviously you have uh, the full draft in your packet. Um, I'm only gonna focus on, I, I would say, the, the larger substantive, substantive items, um, but obviously we're here to answer any, any questions you may have within that draft ordinance. So again, this is, we're, we're speaking medical cannabis only. Uh, we are not talking um, uh, adult use, we're not talking recreational cannabis here, we're talking cultivating cannabis for medical purposes that will be shifted over to medical processors and distributors only. Um, so um, let me actually, let me take a step back. So, so we've obviously, we wanna make sure that we are consistent with the, the ever-changing um, state policies that are, that are currently underway um, you have adult use, recreational use. Um, you have uh, MRSA, you have the medical component. Unfortunately, they don't match. So there's been uh, dozens of pieces of legislation that have been introduced over the years, certainly a lot more now with Prop 64 passing. Um, and the state's doing its best to reconcile uh, both sides of, of cannabis uh, for consistency's sake. And so um, a lot of the legislation and what we're seeing now in these draft uh, rules and regulations from the departments, um, they're essentially trying to address uh, a lot of those issues um, as well. So we've really focused around consistency with state law, um, the utmost consistency with federal guidelines, um, and obviously to promote um, uh, uh, the health and safety and general welfare um, of the county and its residents. So um, we are taking input from the community. We are taking input uh, from the industry members. Uh, we have taken input from the Board of Supervisors. And again, we're here to hear from you folks uh, tonight. Um, so uh, the, the unregulated cultivation of cannabis in unincorporated areas could bring, certainly bring uh, adverse effects to, to the county. You're seeing it now. Uh, you're seeing it now, you're seeing quite a bit of illegal cannabis cultivation um, currently happening throughout San Benito County, not just in rural, uh, you know, San Benito County, um, in the rural rangeland, you're seeing it everywhere. Um, we caught a glimpse of it through this uh, amortization process 
that was developed by the county late last year. The county is currently vetting those um, 20, roughly 25 applications that came in. Uh, that's really only a glimpse of um, the illegal operations, really, that you have uh, going on right now uh, throughout the county. So, um, again, this allows us to really start regulating uh, what's, uh, what's happening out there. So the regulations of property used for cannabis cultivation um, is necessary to avoid the, the criminal element that is sometimes involved with cannabis um, the degradation of natural of the natural environment here in San Benito County, and and a variety of other issues, the environmental impacts, the uh, you know the the hazards and uh, around code enforcement and fire and and so on that could potentially um, impact um, our county. So the the county is looking to implement uh, certainly a strong and effective regulatory uh, and enforcement system. Uh, we are currently drafting or working on drafts of the rules and regulations and operating procedures for these uh, cultivators and how they're going to operate. Um, and so, you know, we've really focused around um, all aspects um, of, of this industry. Um, that's why it was so key to have uh, the sheriff at the table, uh, the district attorney. Um, they've all chimed in, all shared their input with us. And what you're seeing here today is the input that was provided by all of the stakeholders. Um, uh, certainly, to also address the financial issues that you're that are that we're facing here because of the legal operations, um, this cultivation ordinance will give us the opportunity to recover the costs associated with administrating this this program, um, and also um, will allow eventually the, um, the, the opportunity to, to tax the industry as well. Um, those discussions, again, are happening um, right now. We're looking at uh, potential, where, we'll, where we could potentially land on a cannabis cultivation tax. Um, it'll likely be done by square footage. Um, and um, those discussions are currently, currently happening. So that is above and beyond the cost recovery to, to implement the program. Uh, so any person who intends to engage in cannabis business activity will have to obtain um, a permit uh, for the location they're conducting the business, whether they're leasing the property or whether they're purchasing the property. Um, this ordinance creates uh, a, a, the regulatory program and um, allows the, the program to be uh, administered by a cannabis uh, coordinator, which would uh, likely fall under the county administrative uh, department. Um, that person would essentially be in charge. That person would report directly to the CAO and essentially would be in charge of every component of the program, making sure that they work with ag, with code enforcement, with fire, with the sheriff's department, um, and so on. So um, it does create um, a coordinator position to administer the program. Um, so what, what are we looking at when it comes to footprint for these cultivations? Um, so currently we have um, state licenses that you're, you're seeing a few of them here. Um, it depends on whether you're doing fully enclosed warehouse growth or uh, greenhouse growth. Um, the ad hoc committee and others have deviated away from fully, uh, from open growth. So that is not um, uh, on the table right now. Um, other counties have allowed open growth, um, just essentially cannabis open, openly grown in a, in a field. Um, that's, not, that's not being considered at this time. So you are seeing, uh, you are seeing um, indoor and then mixed light, meaning a greenhouse um, uh, in, a, in a few different uh, permit types that, that we're currently looking at up to, um, state law allows up to 22,000 square feet uh, for that purpose. Just a quick question, Victor. So open growth, we're talking medical marijuana, right? That's correct. And so that really has to be raised in sort of a laboratory environment, closed, restricted, controlled environment with indoors or in a or very highly restricted greenhouse kind of an area. This yeah. is medical marijuana, right? That's correct. Yeah, that's okay. correct. So the only, so, you know, obviously we do have the state rules that, that we need to follow. 
but a lot of the inf local enforcement and security component is left to, um, to, to the county, right, to local jurisdictions to implement. Um, some counties that have allowed fully exposed growth um, for medical purposes um, really only require a chain link fence with barbed wire, right? Um, some don't like that. Do, and do, do these um, contain THC? They do. Because marijuana, I mean, medical marijuana, my understanding, what's the other element in there? CBD. Yeah. CBDs. Yeah. And then THC for the hallucinogenic or recreational marijuana. Correct. So the outdoor growth is pretty much the THC, and it's for, they call it mer med medical, but it's for pain relief or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So, so the, the plants are going to contain both, right? The plants are going to contain both THC and CBDs. Um, and then they're, you know, depending on the, on the manufacturing component of it, the extraction, they may create edibles that are, you know, CBD infused for medical purposes, for those purposes only. Um, but um, others will, will have both, right? We'll have the psychoactive component um, in it as well. Um, the, the trend out there currently is really shifting from smoking the product to eating the product. Um, so there is a, a certainly a shift. I can't tell you what it is currently um, throughout the state, but in other jurisdictions I've seen um, you know, roughly 60% of the sales at these dispensaries of, um, really around edibles, around edibles. So I hope that answered your question, Commissioner. Um, okay. So um, again, these are the license types that we're currently looking at. Um, and um, again, up to 22,000 square feet for, um, for these um, greenhouses um, and fully enclosed uh, facilities. What's, the, what's your aversion to open growing? <coughs> what is the... You don't want to permit that. What, what, why? Uh, so the, so the, the, uh, the ad hoc committee members did express concern around the, the security component. Um, of it. When you have it within a greenhouse, at least you have another barrier to, to entry. Um, and then if it's fully enclosed in a warehouse, that's even, it's even tougher for, for uh, security purposes. Where does 22,000 square feet come from? Um, that is a, a state license. So we would be consistent with the, with the state license. And, and, you know, really what, <laughs> I think really uh, from, from my experience in, in this work, um, you know, and, 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 and really I think what the state is really driving toward is, is allowing, you know, smaller um, entrepreneurs to really get uh, infused into, into the business, into the industry. Um, if not, then you could potentially have somebody come in with hundreds of millions of dollars and develop 40 full acres of cannabis. Um, this allows you know, a variety of, of small mom and pop type of facilities uh, to compete really with um, the larger cultivators. That will change over time, right? These, these restrictions will loosen over the next five years. Um, but for now, this is what, what we're currently looking at. And the recreational piece, the, the county doesn't want to address that at all? I mean, that's a, it's legal in the state, right? Um, it's legal to grow, so you could grow it in your backyard, you could grow it in a, in a shed or your inside of your house and, and use it as you see fit. Uh, you cannot purchase it right now. So um, eventually you will. You will be able to purchase it without a medical, without a medical cannabis card. Um, but right now if you want to purchase cannabis, you can only purchase it for medical purposes with a, um, with a medical card. whatever steps we're taking now are consistent with other counties and neighboring jurisdictions in Santa Clara and big, bigger or smaller. Sorry, can you not hear me? I'm sorry, I forgot about this. <laughs> so thank you for reminding me that's not a good thing to do. My question is, are we consistent with other neighboring jurisdictions and the approach that San Benito is taking with the exception about the open growing in some other places? And are we um, looking at the, the reality of the state law being not just limited to medical and to trying to develop a system that's going to be expandable. Um, so to answer your first question, um, 
consistency in, in the public policy arena on cannabis is just not there. So, so jurisdictions, are, jurisdictions are adopting policies that really fit their communities, right? We're, we're certainly not, for example, uh, you know, Santa Cruz. <laughs> Santa Cruz is certainly a, a trailblazer in cannabis. Um, and so they, they're going to adopt policies that fit Santa Cruz and the Santa Cruz residents and the Santa Cruz voters and really how Santa Cruz feels about cannabis. Um, Monterey County, um, I would say, uh, has adopted a pretty similar policy. Um, you know, there, are, so there certainly are differences, but, um, uh, but it's, uh, to an extent, at least somewhat consistent to what, we're, what Monterey County um, has done. Um, Santa Clara County currently has uh, a ban, uh, though that ban is being considered for, um, uh, it's currently under review. The Board of Supervisors in Santa Clara County is um, exploring the opportunity to lift that ban to allow, to potentially allow um, um, at least cultivation in the unincorporated areas of Santa Clara County. Currently, they have a ban, though. So we really don't have a lot of consistency I in our. Said, um, go over the valley. Uh, you know, if you go into the valley, actually, there's a lot of bans. So it, it really follows the demographics. So if you look into the, if you look at the valley, um, and you look at the more. Um, you look at the more conservative counties in, in, um, in uh, the San Joaquin Valley, uh, they're not taking it up and they're not touching it. Um, you look at the coastal cities, you look at, excuse me, the coastal cities and counties, um, and you look at Northern California and other areas, um, yeah, it's completely different than the Central Valley, right? So really, um, there isn't a lot of consistency um, with uh, jurisdictions right now. I think that will change over the next 12 <coughs> months with the um, state reg, state regs coming uh, coming together, um, but um, and I'm sorry, your second question was around the recreational component, right? Right. Well, Manicons I mean, I think it's inevitable unless the state law changes that we have to plan for both. Well, you don't. So you you can you could certainly plan for both. You don't have to do both. So it's up to the county board of supervisors to make that decision if they want to allow it for recreational purposes. Uh, they don't have to allow the sale for recreational purposes. They certainly do have to allow the use and the personal growth of cannabis. That cannot be banned, right? So if your neighbor is growing six plants in their backyard, nothing you can do about it, right? So um, it, it, it puts certain limits on, on it, I, I guess, to answer your question. One question. So federal law. Talk to me about federal law. So, uh, well, I can talk to you about a, 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 a lot of federal law, um, but I'll stick to the let's cannabis. Yeah, let's stay specific to <laughs> cannabis and, and um, whether or not this is consistent with federal law. So that's a, that's a great question. So um, it is not. Um, in a nutshell, it, it isn't consistent with federal law. Um, the only thing, you know, I, I don't want to say the only thing, but there have been... Uh, the, the Department of Justice has, has issued um, a few, you know, their thoughts on, on states' rights on, on cannabis. And really a lot of their focus has been around the criminal element and the criminal component to cannabis. So um, a Deputy uh, Attorney Cole submitted a memo um, a few years back that, that said, hey, look, folks, in the Department of Justice, we're not going to focus our efforts around tackling medical cannabis um, as long as those laws have passed in those states, obviously. Now, we will enforce uh, federal cannabis laws on what they perceive to be criminal enterprises that are operating. And you are seeing some of them in California, and you are seeing some action taken on, the, on those um, um, as well, right? You have UNET here locally that receives federal funding for those to enforce uh, mm -hmm. that, those laws. So, um, so it's, it's very great right now, uh, Commissioner, to answer your question. Um, uh, we, we, you do have a new um, Attorney General, Jeff Sessions, who has certainly come out. Um, he is opposed to any kind of cannabis, whether it's for uh, medical or recreational use. Um, he's indicated his position 
uh, on, on, on cannabis, but um, really that's been it. Um, he's had the opportunity to repeal the coal memo and really say, hey, we're gonna pursue all of this stuff and enforce everything. Um, he hasn't done that. Um, and remember, if, if, even if he wants to do anything like that, um, um, he would have to go to Congress for, for funding uh, necessary to get it done. And Congress has indicated that they're not gonna be entertaining that. Right okay, now. let's expand that for a second. So most of the marijuana money can't go into any kind of bank anyway because those are basically insured by the federal government, right? That's correct, yeah. Okay, so, and there's been threats of people, the Fed saying, well, we'll shut down certain operations or whatever of banks if you do. So we're taking fees for marijuana money. What's to stop the feds if they wanted to to come in and shut us down too? And say, okay, now we're gonna take all of the taxes we normally give you and everything else. Has any, I mean, this is really only an income generator. Okay, and, and, and that's really what it's, this is about. Okay, it brings money to the coffers of the county. So if those coffers are strang basically strangled by the federal government, then what advantage is that? Uh, well, uh, I, I'm certainly, I don't think I'm the person to answer that we question. We haven't gone, yeah, I, it sounds like discussions haven't gone into that direction at all. It's just a little too far out there. Huh? Y y there's, so let me address the banking component of it. So you're absolutely right. I, if, if anybody is conducting business with these cannabis facilities, uh, any federal bank, any federally insured bank in con conducting business, um, yeah, it's problematic and they shouldn't be doing it. Um, that's why you're seeing a lot of this, um, a lot of this money going into um, uh, local credit unions um, and you're seeing a lot of the money um, in cash in um, gun safes in the back of these facilities, right? Um, so is it, yeah, is it problematic uh, from, from that segment currently? Yes, but the, the state is working um, on the banking component as we speak um, to address at least the California state banking issues. So um, uh, I, I can't fully answer that question, right? I don't know what the federal government's gonna do. Yeah, you're right, at any given time, they could come in and say, hey, we're gonna start you know, enforcing uh, this stuff here and there, but again, um, Jeff Sessions has been in, um, um, in his position for some time now, hasn't done anything on it. And even President Trump has indicated that he is in support of medical cannabis. So that's probably a discussion they need to have. <laughs> um, so really beyond that, um, really it's up in the air. I, I really don't know where, where the feds are gonna go with it. So, but it's likely that we could improve medical cannabis and ban recreational cannabis. You could certainly not allow these facilities to be used for recreational purposes. And again, that's not what's being considered um, through this ordinance. <coughs> Victor, why don't you finish your presentation? Sounds good. So, um, so a couple of a couple of things. So, uh, it's there's uh, right now we're not looking at permits for manufacturing. Again, w this is something that will come up eventually. I've been given direction to um, to explore that roughly around September, October timeframe, depending on how fast we move with uh, with this policy. Um, uh, you know, and, 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 and a few of the others, t you know, testing type of facilities and, um, uh, and so on. So um, right now, none of these that you're seeing listed here are allowed through this, what would be allowed through this ordinance. Um, there, shouldn't, there won't be any permits uh, for any non-medical cannabis as, as we talked about um, as well. Um, and um, any person that wishes to engage in, in cannabis uh, business prior to conducting or carrying or engaging in, um, in any of this uh, type of business, again, must have a permit um, issued by, uh, by the county and, and approved by um, uh, this uh, steering committee uh, coordinated by the cannabis coordinator uh, for, for approval. Um, the applicant must submit an application um, and um, would have to, um, we, we would essentially sooner than later adopt a, an application model that, that these cultivators will have to, um, uh, will have to fill out and, and submit to, to the county. 
there will be a fee for that lice for that first for the application fee um, and then um, once it's properly vetted and it makes it through the initial phase one phase two comes in and then we do the full-on vetting of the the, the development um, what's within it um, who's going to operate the businesses do they meet the security components uh, the records components uh, the backgrounds um, that um, these operators will have to go through um, as well so uh, the application uh, will be received and re reviewed as I mentioned earlier by the cannabis coordinator um, and um, will likely include the offices that you see um, listed um, here as well um, again as I mentioned earlier fees will be set for uh, for this process and again eventually for the uh, uh, manufacturing process for the application the annual permitting fee um, and any fees for um, inspection while after they're they're operating um, as well um, so the number of cannabis permits issued in unincorporated San Benito County may be uh, limited uh, the County Board of Supervisors and the ad hoc committee is currently looking at that uh, at potentially putting um, a cap at least on the initial permits um, the city of Hollister opened up their application process it ended I want to say in, in mid-April uh, and I believe they received over 70 applications uh, for a variety they're allowing testing manufacturing cultivation everything right so so we may not get as as that many but um, uh, but I'm, uh, there's certainly interest that I'm already hearing about from folks that, that want to come in and apply um, so no cannabis facility shall be located less than um, 100 feet from any boundary line originally you saw this as 400 feet and it may be 400 feet probably in the draft ordinance uh, we did receive direction from um, at least those that we met with that it'll likely fall closer to about 100 feet from the boundary line um, and then 400 feet from any neighboring residential um, structure um, as well I know that the 400 foot from the parcel line was one of the concerns I received prior to the County Board of Supervisors uh, reviewing this policy on May 9th um, they individually contacted me and expressed concerns about the 400 foot parcel uh, line setback um, and then again we heard um, about it more um, as well during the May 9th um, study session uh, as well so it'll likely land somewhere around 100 feet and that's um, I believe what's going to be mandated by the state um, as well so consistent again with the state um, and then likely look at again a 400 foot uh, from uh, any residential structure um, I'll get into the land use uh, uh, zones and uh, the, land, uh, the, the land use zones in just a sec that'll help I think answer some of these questions uh, when we're talking about the residential component um, because the, the land uses will will not be um, uh, allowed uh, the cannabis will not be allowed in any of the residential land uses and, and all of that stuff so that should help address <coughs> some of these issues so uh, no cannabis facility will be located within a thousand feet of these sensitive uses um, that and you'll see those in your um, in your draft ordinance but they will also be a, 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 a waiver uh, to allow flexibility some of these um, parcels will you know won't be uh, perf you know perfectly put together right so they won't have the perfect sort of model or size that a cultivator is looking for so it'll allow the cannabis coordinator really to work with an sort of sort of odd shaped sort of parcel and allow some flexibility uh, to the cannabis coordinator um, so um, another concern that was brought up um, by the ad hoc committee and stakeholders was around the um, the area south of Trespinos uh, Bellotto Park um, area so uh, the ad hoc committee did and and the stakeholders expressed concerns around this the the county staff's ability to um, enforce this policy in those real real remote areas of San Benito County so um, uh, we took that direction from them uh, we took this to the again to the su county supervisors on May 9th um, and the, consist the consensus was there to create some type of boundary line, a, a south, I guess a South County cannabis boundary line 
Um, I did meet with James um, a few weeks ago, and, um, and I certainly want to thank him for, for the opportunity. Yeah, and um, they are, we are working right now and trying to figure that, figure that out and how that sort of boundary will, will work uh, around that, that Bolado Park, Trespinos kind of area um, as well. So um, located, uh, the, the zones that, that we're currently looking at um, are uh, ag productive, um, uh, agricultural productive, light industrial, uh, agricultural rangeland, um, agricultural rangeland mineral resource, light industrial, heavy industrial, uh, or rural, um, as, I, as um, identified by the, uh, by the county code. Um, and here you'll look at, uh, I know this one may be a little bit difficult for you folks to look at. Um, uh, this is um, really the area that we're gonna be looking at for, for cannabis cultivation, uh, exempting those land uses that, that, that were, after, that were uh, mentioned in the previous slide. Um, so obviously we're looking at the darker green areas of uh, agricultural rangeland, the lighter green, which is um, the prime ag, um, the rural, the, there's a couple of blends of pink, um, but, but the, at least the pink that's focused around the rural areas, uh, not the area where you see Santana Ranch and that, that's, that's different. Um, and then um, uh, some areas around um, aromas um, and so on. So those are really the, the areas that, that you're looking, that we're looking at, at least currently. Um, cannabis business um, activity should not create hazards due to the use and storage of materials and so on. That's uh, really, again, addressing some of, the, um, some of the issues that were brought up around um, the environmental, potential environmental impacts um, uh, for, uh, caused by, potentially caused by the industry. Um, all cannabis business cultivation activities shall be conducted inside closed buildings or structures, um, and all cannabis, re regardless of stage of growth, shall, be, shall not be visible uh, from the um, exterior of, of, um, of the building. This is really important, especially around the industrial zones that actually have smaller um, uh, parcel sizes. Um, those will really only be focused around uh, fully enclosed um, type of facilities in those industrial zones. Um, enforcement, uh, so the cannabis coordinator and other enforcement officers shall have the right to enter these facilities and monitor these facilities anytime. So they will need, you know, closed circuit television. Um, the sheriff will have access at any given time to these facilities from his phone, from his computer, from his iPad, uh, from his desk, wherever he's going to Wherever he wants to chime in, he can log right in and take a look at a, a live picture of what's going on within any of these facilities that will be licensed um, in the county. And also allow him, uh, the cannabis coordinator, or um, anybody else given the, uh, the authority to um, enter these facilities at any given time to make sure that only staff, only proper staff is, is allowed to be in these, in these facilities. Um, additional enforcement uh, details will be provided as we develop the rules and regs um, and operating pr procedures. That'll include, you know, the, the, the chain link fencing um, with razor wire around the greenhouses, um, the, uh, you know, the window coverings in the, in the warehouse structures, um, you know, signage, um, and, and so on. So that'll be addressed in the, in the rules and regs. Um, and again, the, the discussion around the taxing structure uh, will continue to take place. Um, speaking of inconsistencies in, in counties, we're seeing a lot of that in, in the tax structure right now as well. So you're seeing some jurisdictions at 15 to $25 per square foot, uh, like Monterey County, who is, to be completely honest with you now, panicking because uh, they're, they're too high. Uh, you're seeing other counties like Yolo County at 250 a square foot, and you go up to the Emerald Triangle, and you'll see, you know, anywhere from a dollar to a dollar plus, five dollars. City of Hollister is around seven dollars. So, certainly those counties that are up there are uh, uh, are going to have to make adjustments um, because as a county, your your biggest competitor is other counties. Um, so. Um, you know, that's certainly something that the supervisors will have to take into account as they develop their, um, 
the tax policy. So with that said, I apologize for the uh, lengthy presentation, uh, but if you have any questions, uh, I can certainly answer those uh, for you. Well, uh, should we hear from the public first and then we'll bring it back up to the commission? Anyone in the public would like to address? Good evening. Uh, my name is Steve Becerra. I'm a San Diego County resident. Um, and I just wanted to bring this conversation back to what it really is. You heard a lot about Prop 64, recreational marijuana. Passed. Some of us who voted for it really had no intention to allow commercial uh, cultivation in our counties. But you could surely grow six plants in your backyard. Those plants grow 15 feet tall, eight feet wide. You can grow six of them. You can grow six of them if you're a medical marijuana car holder or more, depending on how much your doctor has given you uh, permission to grow. 15 feet tall, eight feet wide. The, each plant can produce 15 to 25 pounds of dried marijuana. But this conversation is about medical marijuana and uh, commercial cultivation of medical marijuana in our county. And uh, I don't know if, if you've read every page of this ordinance, but I have. And this ordinance is really in its infancy in discussion. It may not be in its infancy in discussion with the cannabis uh, stakeholders who may have been uh, wanting to come here and grow marijuana in our county since January, but it is with your constituents and all of us that live here. So there's a bunch of concerns, and I'm just going to address a couple of them. Talk about ag productive land. There's no limitation on the number of, uh, of uh, operations that may be allowed. It could affect Mark's district, District 1, ag productive. There's a lot of hundreds of five acre parcels that may have a, a marijuana cultivation operation within a, a hundred feet of your property line. The one thing that uh, wasn't mentioned um, about concerns, security is really a big securing, uh, issue. So just Google uh, criminal acts that have been taking place in cultivation sites throughout the United States or where people allow, or cities that allow this to go on. But that's just one. Odor mitigation is a major concern. So that's why we hope that if this happens in this county, it's done inside buildings with significant odor mitigation, air scrubbing, um, to keep this odor of marijuana, which is uh, pretty powerful um, and can affect your quality of life if you're living next door to a marijuana grow and you have a five acre parcel in ag productive. And secondly, just one other thing real quick. Um, this or it's sort of crazy. This ordinance allows, there's some, there's some reason you could be denied a permit. One of them is, that you have a felony conviction for embezzlement. You, maybe you embezzled $2,500 of uh, your, at your employer. The other one is if you sold drugs with uh, enhancement where you sold more than 2.2 pounds of heroin, cocaine, marijuana, methamphetamine, PCP. But if you sold less than that, less than 34 ounces of drugs were convicted, went to prison, you can still get a permit to grow marijuana in our county. It's crazy. It just, it's just absolutely crazy. So I encourage you to take a close look at this ordinance, read it thoroughly, because there's, this is just two items that are really important and, and the conversation has just begun with your constituents. You should have some public meetings like the city did in, at, at the uh, Memorial Building. It's really important. Thank you. Uh, Thank Steve, you. before you leave. Yes. Background, you're retired police, right? Yeah, so um, my background is I've been a resident here in this county f uh, since 1979. I was a Hollister policeman for three years and a, a Gilroy police uh, officer. I retired as a sergeant. I spent um, five years undercover uh, working with the ANET tra task force uh, in San Jose. Uh, one detective from each uh, city in the county of Santa Clara w were assigned there. Um, uh, my primary assignment was uh, uh, for most of the time I was a multi-kilo -co cocaine dealer. Um, and, um, and one quick thing that I would mention about UNET, our, our UNET task force, we have one here, two officers. That's, all, that's what it's down to right now. But that's my background. And uh, right now I, I, I'm a business owner here in town. I'm a broker. I have a small uh, real estate company. Uh, but my, I raised my family here, um, my brothers and sisters, my mom and dad are here. Um, you know, this is an important issue. It really is. Any other questions before I? No, I got, I'd like to reserve you till later on property values when I bring that up. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Anybody else?
Hello, my name is Elia Salinas and I'm a county resident as well. And I've got three minutes. I've got so many notes here I want to go through. So let's start real quick with in February 2014, the Cole memo was issued. And that basically gave the uh, authority to the agents out there not to enforce in medical marijuana states as long as they abide by a there's a list of 10. And the most important one was um, just, uh, no, me no medical marijuana near schools. And I know that you guys have, um, in the ordinance here, it's 1,000 feet from school buses. That's not included in the state ordinance. Um, but definitely schools and drug rehab. And I don't believe it's mentioned in here, but I think you should do that. Um, September of 2015, the um, federal government stopped uh, issuing funds to the uh, DEA to enforce in any medical marijuana states. So since September of 2015, there have been no funds for the DEA to enforce in any medical marijuana states, which means that that's still going on now. And um, with regards to that, uh, Sessions has said that he will not be enforcing any of the, any anything against medical marijuana in states as, as well. The um, attorney, uh, attorney General for California, Becerra, and uh, the Governor Brown have also said we don't want the we don't want the federal government in our state. Stay out. We're th this is something that we allowed. Um, as opposed to uh, let's see the bank system. You had a question around the bank system. I'm trying to hurry up here. Uh, Fiona Ma, she's a chairperson for the Board of Equalization, and they are actually working right now on a banking system for the state that it'll, it'll be run by the state. But then in the meantime. 80% of the medical marijuana facilities in the county of Los Angeles, 80% of those are all being done electronic payments and they're going directly into banks. There are large banks that you have to sign an NDA to be able to open up a bank account, but there are numerous banks that are FDIC approved or insured that money is going through there. So there's, there's a lot of things I need to, you know, you guys don't know about and I'm running out of time here. Um, Let's see, um, outdoor. I would love to see outdoor. I know people complain about the smell. Um, believe it or not, I'm a big advocate for medical marijuana, and I'm not a consumer, but I like the way the plant smells outdoors. Some of them, some of them do smell bad. Um, to mitigate um, illegal grows, uh, one of the things that has not been mentioned is hemp. I would love to see hemp being grown in San Benito County. I would like to see it grown in South County. Um, people who are going to be doing illegal grows in South County, hemp would cease that because it would pollinate their outdoor marijuana out there, whether, you know, um, uh, anyway, it, it would, they would not like it. So if you wanted to get rid of illegal grows, I think you should allow to grow some hemp. So, ran out of time, I got more things to say. Good evening and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Tony Labou, San Diego County resident. Um, what I'd like to say this afternoon, this evening is uh, competition is gonna be big in this environment. And if we try to tax this at a level above our neighboring counties, we're gonna lose that opportunity to generate that sales tax revenue from some of these people. There's been some talk about being $15, $20 a square foot. And in the reasoning of that, you really can't balance the county's budget problems on a select few of individuals that are trying to create some business activity in our community. Uh, I think we should be reasonable in the amount that we tax these people, but I do think there is a tax basis that we should charge them because there is some impacts that we will incur because of their type of business, but let's be realistic about how much we actually do charge them. Let's not be more than our neighboring community is. As, and I've heard $15 a square foot, which is, you know, we're gonna lose some of that. We're gonna lose some of those growers that are trying to be in here if we do these astronomic numbers. Um, secondly, I'd like to discuss the, uh, the matter of being 100 feet, uh, some of the smaller parcels. I think 100 feet is more than sufficient if you put it 100 feet from building to building. And of course, we, I do encourage the mitigation of odor control with closed greenhouses and charcoal, charcoal filters to mitigate those odor controls. Uh, I don't want to take any more of your time, but thank you very much for the opportunity to speak, and, uh, and I am supporting this uh, ordinance that you're trying to pass. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. <clears throat> Would anyone else like to address the commission? 
Okay, I'll bring it back then to the commission. And Jean, would you, do you have questions or comments? None. None, okay. Mark? No. Okay. Ray? Go ahead and go first, then I'll. Okay. Okay, I got quite a few questions. Mm -hmm. First of all, on the definitions, on one of them is to clarify what bus stop means. You know, that's not real clear. Not real clear. And Victor, that's one. Do you, I'm sorry. Before, oh, go ahead. Victor, do you have a definition for bus stops? Are we talking schools and what? What is a bus stop? Cog bus stops or? Yeah, well, we, we identify them as school as school bus stops, not not, not the public transportation. Not bus residential stops. bus stops? Correct. Okay. Yeah. That kind of clears the It was not real clear on there, and I looked it up, and it's not real clear on the code. Under the California Code uh, of Regulations, uh, 1238. The other thing is, uh, I know Victor's mentioned that he wants a small business to operate. But with the setbacks they're set on there, anybody with a five acre parcel can't really operate because you'll put them way out of the range. You know, some, acre, some five acre parcels are narrow. So 100 feet setback, it's, I think it should be zero setbacks with security around. And I agree that it should be grown indoors on the five acre parcels with uh, some kind of control, odor control. So the setbacks of 400 feet to be stretched out and maybe 100 feet from a residence. And the other Sorry, question. Supervisor Rodriguez, you think 100 feet is sufficient? Uh -huh, from a residence. Okay. Not from the boundaries. I think the city's residence, uh, it's, uh, I want to say 150 feet in the, in the city. Okay. So. The other question I have, and you can't answer it. They're not allowing any uh, manufacturing right now. They just want to do the, the growing, and that's going to be coming up from understanding? That's correct, yeah. As soon as we wrap this up and the application period, uh, we, uh, assumingly the application period opens up likely somewhere around September, October time frame, uh, we would then start developing the uh, manufacturing ordinance. Because I think if the manufacturing ordinance comes in place, that it's going to generate quite a bit of income, in my opinion because it'll be a liquor business. And yeah, there's really no federal regu regulations. They're just comments and guidelines. Am I correct? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. So s I know the application said you have to comply with federal. That's kind of should be removed. Well, from uh, uh, comply with federal guidelines, right? I mean, what, what Not with federal regulations because there's none. Is that what we have in, in there? I'm looking at page 13 of 26, item N on the, the application. And it, the application is written very well. I mean, there's a lot of rules in there. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, You find it? Uh, page, yeah, I think uh, that that <laughs> pertains to not like regulations pertaining to marijuana, but um, like tax tax codes. Um, let's say if you have work, I mean, I assume that they would be subject to workers' comp. Uh, just well, well, yeah, but there's no, uh, you can't pay federal taxes because you can't comply. But state, I mean, state regulations, yes. And of course, uh, workers' comp and everything Whatever. that comes uh, in. Maybe it. pesticide storage. There might be some federal regulations that still could apply. Or state, state regulations. regulations. Yeah. And the other question I had, I think we talked about the restriction already. It's over and over in this <coughs> pamphlet. And uh, the only thing, the other question I have is cabinet coordinator, is it going to be one individual or is it going to be a group of individuals? Because if you have one individual, he can pick and choose who he's going to allow, mm -hmm. you know. Because you'll, 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 turn, you'll turn back into the good old buddy system. Um, it, it won't. So right now we have it I mean, set up as really um, 
you know, this, this cannabis coordinator will essentially play the, uh, the lead, I guess the lead administrator would probably be uh, appropriate, right? The lead administrator of the program, but um, would not work solely through the application vetting process and all of that. Um, as, as we mentioned um, in here, it will include um, the uh, Ag Commissioner, Code Enforcement, the Sheriff's Department, um, and so on for proper vetting. So those will be all the ones that will be? They'll all be involved. They'll be all involved, just not one individual. That's correct. So we're trying to avoid, I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to see, That's avoid the good old uh, buddy. That's a very valid know. concern, yep. Yeah. And, um, and it, it won't be like that. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, if we do it away with the, the 400 feet, it allows the small entrepreneurs, like you said. Yeah, we're gonna. No, you, you're, the way it's written right now, or the way it was drafted on this manual, it just allows for big corporations to come in, big farmers. Yeah, so we'll take all of your certainly take back all of your comments and share those with um, with the ad hoc committee. Okay, that's those questions I had concerns. Okay, Victor, thank you for coming in. Could you throw your map back up, your zoning map? I mean, this is a planning commission. We might as well talk about zoning, right? Like so a good that's idea. really all you want to talk to us about. Okay, so um, I think you need to re uh, you need to re-engineer your map. Okay, you need to um, you need to uh, sort of reverse engineer. Okay, okay. so you you came in. You said this isn't we're an agricultural community. This is an agricultural crop. You're making it an agricultural crop. So I think what you need to do is you need to outline all the areas that are restrictive and the areas you've set up is restrictive and then you need to allow if you're going to do this cannabis everywhere else in the county now the reason for that is I just had um, an offer placed on a property that the real value uh, ag value is 50,000 an acre at the most probably more like 40,000 they came in and wrote their offer for a hundred and ninety-five thousand dollars an acre now what's wrong with this picture and how much do you want to how much do you want your lettuce to cost you in the future we grow lettuce here we grow tomatoes here onions here do you still want to do that if you want to do that I don't think they can do that at a hundred and ninety-five thousand an acre you're gonna come in and falsely inflate the ag land community to through the roof so I don't think anyone's looking at that but we're talking land right this is planning so I think Steve can probably bear out too because he's a broker as well I don't know if he's had any things like that basically this was a large marijuana group they had nothing but money they said oh, we can throw as much money at as as we want we don't care well, we're gonna get paid back next year they're going to have big profits. They actually told me that uh, when I told them they're actually in the wrong place because I was a planning commissioner instead of a supervisor, they said, oh, well, we'll go talk to them then. We can talk money to them. So it, it's, it's, they know that they're enticing you with huge profits and a chance of making some budget but how long is that going to last? Sort of as soon as Big Pharma finds out about this and it and shows itself that it can be a profit, you know, Big Pharma is just going to come in and take it over anyway if it's medical pharma. And they're already having large uh, groups that are doing that anyway. So what you want to do, I, I see this as us awakening a sleeping giant. Just kind of like what Yamamoto did after he bombed, you know, Pearl Harbor and woke up the United States. I see this as a huge, huge issue that could happen in our future if we allow it to. But the bigger deal is, is if you end up breaking your map up the way you're doing, that 3,500% increase in value, you just give to some of your friends and not to others. And some of the people in the county and not to others. So you draw the lines and tell them why the guy on the other side of that green line, his value is a thousand or two an acre, and the other one on the other side is one hundred and ninety-five thousand an acre. So to be totally fair, if you're going to do that in a zoning point of view only, in a in a land value point of view, then you should open it up and back engineer it to where 
you set back from all of your restrictions and the rest of the county is allowed to, to go forward. I think you'll be sorry if you do that. The only other way to do it is to do maybe a, a zoning overlay. So now you've got the same problem. Okay, you're gonna overlay certain areas of the county that say your land value now is 3,500% higher than your neighbor. Why? Why didn't I get it? Why is my five acres not? You're already gonna have to do it anyway to the setback people. So I think those are things that need to be addressed and, and I think you need to start looking at, uh, and okay, my background I have to give it up to. I'm retired state law enforcement. I worked in a, a correctional facility, Solidad, it's a fun place. Most of the people I met were in there either because of drugs or alcohol. And I got this, all the stuff Steve's sent down, I got to take care of. It's not a fun environment, but that's, they were there because of that mostly. Now, medical marijuana, I see a total need for that. I'm not in disagreement about medical marijuana, but I think this is just piercing the veil and getting ready for recreational. And if you do that, I think you're in trouble. You're already gonna be in trouble because of land value issues anyway. That's already proven itself out. I think those questions need to be taken back to your ad hoc. You need to look at those really seriously and then say, maybe we should just ban this and not think about the money, think about the moral issue. We'll share those comments with the uh, ad hoc committee. Thank you. Is this an action item or this is just discussion tonight, Just discussion, right? okay. it's a study session, yes. Um, so I didn't have any questions, but I, in terms of discussion, um, I do see this as a, a monster waiting to happen and I'm really sort of loath to think that San Benito County needs to do this because it can't pass a tax measure with its voters. Um, and I would just encourage the county to go as slow as it can on it. And um, I do see also that well, we may be talking medical now, the likelihood is that these things work wherever they work, um, that it's gonna expand. I'm not in favor of that. Um, I'm not even sure that we should <coughs> do this at all in this county, but um, you know, in terms of um, what I see, the ordinance is well written if your objective is to make some money. I agree though with the conversation about people being entitled to a bonus that is w not random, um, but it's selected in a way that raises issues. I almost think we'd be better off with a lottery system. Decide who's eligible, who qualifies, and then some kind of lottery, but nothing tied to any kind of land use. Within, you know, within their limits of schools and all the other things we want to protect. It, it needs a lot of work. This is a big deal. Maybe uh, they could consider not allowing it to be grown on prime ag land. Then you're not gonna interfere with prime ag land and the lettuce production, right? I mean, this stuff grows anywhere. They grow it up in these hillsides, you know. Yeah, the the other one really the focus on the, the, the five acre parcels seems real logical to me because they're not very viable ag parcels. You're gonna only be allowed to, that's just over a, half an acre, right, 22,000 square feet. So a half an acre and a five acre parcel is, seems like a nice fit and you're not messing up really very few parcels of five acres for a viable unit. So I, you know, and, and then actually there probably is some prime land within those and that, but that's okay because it, it can't practically farm it anyway. I, I just have a, I know that some of you are against it, and but again, how many times have projects come up in front of the board for the last 30 years and as it gets done? It's never viable, it's not good, shouldn't be here. And uh, as I say, we keep missing the boat. Really? The outlets wanted to come here. A lot of businesses wanted to come here, but we did say, no, they're not, you know. When are we gonna start? moving forward and then stop rejecting everything that comes up. 
This needs a lot of work. I agree. They need to really do the research on it. But I think this marijuana thing is only going to go on for about three or four years. When everybody is in this, going to be it's going to be gone. So why can't the county bank on that for the t meanwhile? Because there's no money for the county to operate. And if we keep rejecting everything that comes in front of the board, then we're going to go bankrupt. That's why I see it. We're going to be paying for all the retirement plans, all the medical plans, all the supervisors, all the county offices, all the police department, and we don't get tax dollars in here. And I've been hearing they want to tax homeowners. When is that going to stop? You know, we just got to start moving forward and start allowing projects, regardless of what nature is, but just fine tune it. That's, like they're doing it. They're yeah, that's just my opinion. What you want. Uh, uh, just one other comment, and I don't know if this is even feasible at all, but if we could do something better than other people, let's just do organic medical marijuana. Maybe we could find a niche that would make it worthwhile and then make it, I agree, go to smaller parcels. I have one of those, so I don't want to recommend that because it would be self-serving and it's the last thing I want to do. But I don't think we should take prime ag land and big lots of it and, and change its use. I mean, this is about health. We need the food more than we need this. Um, and I don't disagree that we need money. I, and this is better than other options, but it does need some real good fine-tuning, I think. Yeah, but how do you tell the prime ag people, okay, I'm sorry, you could have sold your land for, you know, 195000 an acre, and we're not going to let you because we're the planning commission. We've decided that only hillsides are going to be able to grow this or only five acres or whatever. How you, how are you going to tell them that? How are you going to go into the whole San Juan Valley and tell every landowner in there that you've restricted them and you've just shut down the value of their property if you're going to allow it into the county at all? Is that fair? We're looking for a fair way. And I, I know, but is that fair? No, it's not. And so that's why I said maybe a lottery system, uh, maybe a certain five acres or ten acres or whatever mm -hmm. for anybody, whether you're big or little or whatever, you mm -hmm. can have ten. It, if it's one ownership, you can't have more. I mean, try and level the playing field somehow. Well, isn't there a chart there that's restricting the, the maximum of 22,000 square feet? Uh, per permit. That's per, correct. Per, per parcel. So if a guy has a 1,000 uh, acre parcel, he can only go 22,000 square feet of medical uh, marijuana. That's not necessarily correct. So, okay. so you, can allow, you can't allow multiple permits per, per parcel. Okay. Well, it's the same thing. And, 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 and on that point, uh, Commissioner Rodriguez, um, you know, we did receive feedback from the, from the ad hoc committee and the board of supervisors last week, um, really around the, the land use preservation, right, to, to some of your concerns, right? If you have um, a 40-acre parcel and you're only using half of an acre, 22,000 square feet, what's going to happen with the rest of the footprint of that property? Um, likely that will be... Um, likely that will be a, a multiple permit location. So it won't be 22,000 square feet only. It will be 22,000 square feet for that permit to be allowed, right? So, um, again, multiple permits can be allowed per, uh, per APN or parcel, however you want to describe it. Victor, uh, being devil's advocate here from everything that's been said, what's to stop? every person in San Juan Valley to decide their prime egg land is now going into medical marijuana? Is, um, is there really some limit? The I mean, have we said... Well, the biggest... I'm sorry, Commissioner. I just wanted to... Is there some limit on the number of permits? Yes. So, so that's really where the... I think where the, where the, the focus uh, has been as of late with, with the members. Um, it is something that the, that the board discussed on May 9th. It's something that we took back to to the ad hoc committee as well as a potential option. Um, I don't I, I don't recall. I don't think we landed at a specific number. I know the number 50 had been tossed around at least as an initial sort of first phase, right? 50 permits um, to allow the cannabis coordinator to vet those, um, and then as you see in your ordinance as well, only allowing applications to be taken in during certain time periods of the year, right? So. 
to answer your question, likely to permit limitations. All right, if you're talking about 50 permits, basically that's 25, 25 acres. acres yeah. So you're talking about 25 acres of land in all of San Benito County that, I, I'm just trying to, you know, what are we really talking about? Yeah, yeah, you're, you're right, likely, right. well, I'll say this, up to 25 acres. Um, you're, you're gonna get a lot of applicants that are not looking to cultivate 22,000 square feet. Right. They're just not, they don't have the money, they don't have the resources, they don't have the manpower for that type of operation. So you're, you could potentially see, you know, a type one, type two permit of, you know, 5,000 feet, uh, square feet and, and, and so on. So uh, 25 acres at, at the most countywide. I guess my mean? question is, why are we doing it? For 25 acres, why are we doing it? <laughs> mm. Yeah, it, ha it hasn't, it, it hasn't. Yeah. I mean, but, you know, this is just going round and round. And, and I just want to make sure that everybody looks at it with open eyes before we do anything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't want all the prime egg land in San Juan Valley to go into marijuana, obviously, but if we're talking about 25 acres, that doesn't make sense either. I, it, you know, there's, I don't know. Uh, um, there's one thing that I think we should do, though, um, and, and would be the next step, and that would be simply open it up to a public workshop or scoping to where we can bring the public in. I mean, that's really what we're good about, um, bringing the public in so they can voice their opinion on it. And, and just push this to uh, some kind of a public meeting that's at a time and a, and a place and space to where the discussion can be opened up more on a county level and not a city level. Okay, Louis. Madam Chairman and members of the board, Louis Valdez with uh, the Central Administrative Office. To uh, Commissioner Pierce's point, we had a public meeting last week where we did exactly that. And I think the meeting lasted right around hour and a half to two hours. And we made public um, a few days in advance the draft uh, ordinance that I believe uh, was provided to you. And the room was full and uh, the, the message at least that I think came through on the draft that was presented, there was a great deal of consensus around the draft that was presented. And there were certainly concerns that were raised. Mr. Pissarro was here and there were other folks who were, who were here and they certainly raised their concerns. But I think from an administrative perspective, um, having been uh, staffed to the ad hoc along with Victor and, and Sarah, um, the parameters that have been, uh, for the most part, they're not completely finalized yet, but for the parameters that you see in this ordinance um, were pretty well received. So I just kind of wanted to put that in front of you because we did, we have had major uh, efforts made um, to provide a public forum for this ordinance to uh, be spoken to by the public on many occasions. So I just wanted to make sure that, that we put on the record that we've made a very concerted effort, the ad hoc has, um, and the Board of Supervisors to provide the public as much possible input and as much transparency to the process as possible. And, and Louis, I thank you for that. But I wonder, was it done to the detail that we are talking about as the Planning Commission right now? I mean, were we talking about limiting it to 50 permits, uh, 25 acre. I mean, if, if it wasn't done to that detail, we can spin our wheels and finalize an ordinance and everybody's gonna say it's wrong. Right, and I understand that. Now, you have the ordinance and then you will have the rules and regulations that adjoin the ordinance and we were going to work through those. But I thought Commissioner Rodriguez raised a very important point. The coordinator is going to be doing exactly uh, what is meant by the ordinance, and that is coordinating the disparate, um, the disparate departments within the county, the district attorney and the sheriff and the ag commissioner um, and the finance department and everybody who needs to be involved to vet each one of those applications. As a matter of fact, internally we've had those discussions. How is it gonna work? And so those details, um, this is a bit of a work in progress, but I think that the board's been pretty clear about what approach they want uh, for staff to take when, when we implement, if the ordinance does pass, uh, the ordinance uh, in, its, in its final form. So we've been pretty detailed about discussing that at length in the ad hoc. 
you know, how many permits, where and when and how and so forth. What, what day and what time did this meeting happen? We had a special meeting last week. Yeah, what day and what time? 6 p.m. on May 9th. And that was uh, 6 p.m. here in the board chambers on May 9th. Okay. And we had pretty much a packed house. So the commuters are just still on the roadway. I'm sorry? The commuters are still on the roadway. Six o'clock. So uh, have you considered doing this on a Saturday or a weekend where everyone's here and home and ready to go? And that's kind of what I was talking about as far mm -hmm. as, as a meeting or a group getting together to where everyone would have a chance to mm -hmm. come in and, and because they'd already be home. And hopefully they wouldn't be working on the weekend as well. But let's face it, you know, what is it, 78 or 80 percent of our town's commuter traffic? And yeah. Commissioner uh, Pierce, your point's well taken, but we did have a full, <laughs> fully stacked room here with a lot of folks who came in and uh, made some comments. But the board certainly can uh, mm -hmm. can uh, ask and direct that we do that. Yeah, and I, I, I would think that that's a board of supervisors thing, really, rather than ours. I think yeah, it's it should stay where it is with elected people who are responsible to mm -hmm. the public. And my opinion, if something's that important, you're going to show up, you're going to cut out of work early, you're going to you're going to make an effort to be here. I mean, those people want to, I mean, you go to church, you make an effort to go to church. You know, you got, you want to be somewhere, you make an effort to be there. Cut out of work early, don't go to work. If you want to place your opinion. Just like us, we're here because we want to be here. Okay, okay is there anything, oh. no future discussion? Thank you. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. If not. <coughs> okay. Then I will close that. And uh, discussion, I just want to remind everybody about the joint meeting with the two cities on Tuesday, May 23rd, 6 o'clock, the Veterans Building. And I think that we all got copies of the agenda tonight. Yes. If there's no other business, I will take a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs>